a show where we talk about warbirds, history, World War II, flying, and much more. This show is supported by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. This nonprofit membership organization has preserved and flown historic aircraft for more than 65 years. CAF's mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. If you'd like, you can support the CAF organization through a donation, by becoming a member or volunteering your time and talents. Visit commemorativeairforce.org for more information and to find a unit near you, plus all the events that uh, CAF aircraft will be attending uh, this uh, summer and fall. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and, and again, thanks for joining us this evening. If you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, or GoToMeeting, welcome. If uh, you are on one of the social media platforms, if you take a just a moment to either hit the, the share or the like button, uh, if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and uh, follow us. And if you do subscribe, make sure you click on that little bell as well so you get notifications anytime we go live or we have any uh, new uh, videos that are posted to our YouTube channel. And there's more than just the uh, CAF uh, webinars. We've got uh, lots and lots of interesting content uh, submitted by our units and members, and uh, it's all there on the CAF media uh, page of YouTube. Now, as you're watching our presentation tonight, you may have some questions. If you do, just type them in the comment section of whatever social media platform you're on. We'll try to answer them either during the presentation or we'll save time at the end uh, to make sure that we answer those questions before we sign off. Now, this episode, I'm very excited about because we're going to take a look at another B-17 Flying Fortress, one of my favorite airplanes, that's currently under restoration, Champagne Lady. And joining us from the Champaign Aviation Museum in Urbana, Ohio, is Dan Dickerson. Dan, welcome to the uh, welcome to the program. Thank you, Steve. Glad well, to be here. Before we get started, tell us a little bit about uh, you and your background uh, in aviation. Uh, I recognize airplanes two out of three times. That's Good. about my background. Um, actually, I'm a retired Highway Patrol Post Commander, but I became a volunteer here about five and a half years ago. Enjoy every minute of it, and I'm now on board of directors here at the museum. I don't have much of a background, though, in aviation. <laughs> That's okay. You're an enthusiast just like uh, the rest of us, and uh, you, must, uh, you must enjoy uh, coming to the museum and, and spending your time there because you've been a, a volunteer for uh, a number of years. Yeah, that's correct. It, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the people are great. The volunteers are just fantastic. And uh, it's really opened my eyes. And every day I walk in here, I learn something new about a B-17. And I'm not exaggerating. Well, let's, let's, why don't you tell everybody the story of, of how the, uh, how Champagne Lady came to be is, and actually the genesis of uh, the museum itself. Okay. Uh, in 05, a gentleman named Jerry Schiffer decided to take on this project. And they started in an old hangar at the south end of the Grimes Field. And uh, that in December of that year, they drove in with three flatbed truckloads of what looked like scrap going to a scrap yard, uh, literally. And uh, that very same day or shortly thereafter, I'm not real sure about the timeline, he flew his twin engine Cessna out to Bozeman, Montana and crashed and was killed. So the project kind of sat for about two months, but he had three children, uh, they're middle-aged, and they decided to go ahead with the project. And as I said, it started an old hangar at the south end of the field. But it's a great family, and eventually they built the hangar you're going to see today and donated it. And everything is now under control of a board of directors, but the family is still very much involved. That's awesome. Well, you're standing in the lobby right now, um, and we're looking at a, a beautiful painting of uh, the B-17. But can you tell us a little bit about that painting? Uh, we have a retired school teacher who does all the artwork here. He's done the nose art, all the artwork you would see. Everybody says, well, he must have taught art. No, he taught aerospace, and his father was a radio operator on B-17s and flew a number of missions over, in, uh, over Germany. So he does all the artwork very fast, too. But this is what it's going to look like. And I'd like to point out, we say restoration, but only 20, uh, 15% of what you'll see 
is restored. The other 85% is rebuilt. In other words, we've built it by hand. Well, and you have a, a couple of uh, B-17 related items in the lobby. Why don't you uh, take a look at those? That's correct. Why don't we start here with the ball turret? The ball turret is complete. Uh, we didn't have to do a whole lot on it. Uh, it actually, and you may be familiar with this more than I am, it was in a barn in Colorado where a gentleman had the front half of the B-17 as part of his barn. And we eventually acquired it. It's ready to go, it's ready to be hung in B-17 when we get to that point. We have actually had a 90 some year old vulture gunner show up here and wedge himself back into this. When they come in, they're 18, 20 years old again. So we're, we're really happy to have that. And the other corner over here, one of our right 1820 um, engines, we have five that are ready to go. They were certified, but they're due for recertification because we're not moving as fast as we thought we would. But of course, we were all kind of new uh, to the restoration and the rebuild process, but it's ready to go. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the uh, museum itself, you, you mentioned uh, some of the volunteers. About how many volunteers uh, do you have that, that uh, come in on a somewhat regular basis to help out the project or just the operations of the museum? We average around 80 to 100. You know, it wax and wanes a little bit. Uh, when I first started this project, it was going to be to teach younger people how to do this type of stuff. And we do do a, an amount of that. But like one of the guys said, we didn't know it was going to turn into a senior citizen project. So <laughs> um, if one of our volunteers dies, we actually have a 50 caliber round engraved and it's in the feed belt in the nose of the V-17. So that was kind of nice. Very nice. Uh, against the wall is our tail gunner's position. And that is ready to go. It's ready to be molded on the plane. And it was pretty much entirely made by the volunteers here, including the 50 calibers, because as you probably know, the ATF frowns when you're having the real thing. We go back around the back and take a quick look inside it. We have a tail gunner, he's 98 years old. And 35 missions. He flew 35 missions to January of 45. Um, he took down a Messerschmitt and a Fock Wolf on the same mission and became one of the lead tail gunners for the 8th Air Force. He still drives himself in here. He's usually in about every Saturday and he holds court. The visitors just love to talk to him. Still sharp as a tack. His name is Art Kemp. That's amazing. He holds the distinguished flying cross also. Impressive. So now, did I understand you correctly? This will be the, the tail section that gets uh, put on the airplane when it's ready? That's correct. Okay. And as I'm sure you know, this is how they built them. You know, it was built separate and bolted on. Okay. And one other thing in the lobby I'd like to mention. All right, shall we move on into the hangar and not? Uh... Oh, sure. Yeah, we have a, we have a role of honor. Uh, people can induct a family member who served in the military into it. It was mainly started for those that actually flew during World War II. But we have, golly, it uh, must be in the thousands by now. And we do this presentation every October. Okay. 
Well, now, before we get to the good stuff, someone's going to ask what that uh, vehicle is that you're standing in front of. <laughs> that is a Crosley, uh, 1941 Crosley, and it was actually restored by one of our volunteers who has since passed on and his family donated it to the museum. Okay, I'm going into the hangar. This is our C-47. Uh, we're gradually restoring it. It gets ignored a little bit. We're mainly on the B-17, <laughs> but uh, as best we can find, it was used in the biggest airborne drop of World War II. It was flown in here, and as I said, we're gradually restoring it. It'll take a while. One little stop I wanted to make as we were walking through here is this uh, display case. I don't know if you can see it or not very well, but this is our tail gunner's equipment and uh, paraphernalia he brought back from World War II. And on the mission where he shot down the two fighters, his bomber uh, B-17 was shot up very bad. Uh, ball turret gunner was killed, waist gunner was uh, severely wounded. And I asked Art, what about the other waist gunner? And he told me at that stage of the war, we flew with only one waist gunner. I don't know if you ever heard that or not. And so the uh, measure spent pilot thought Art and the tail was dead. And he got low and off the right wing and flew in formation with them for five minutes. And finally, when he put his flaps down and started to move back to finish him off, uh, the tail gunner he thought was dead came alive when he could swing the guns on him and got him. He parachuted successfully out of the plane, but his chute didn't open. And we researched him back. We have his picture and that uh, Messerschmitt pilot was a Maldi ace. That's when they made him a lead tail gunner. And that's when he got the uh, Distinguished Flying Cross. Okay, we'll move on in here. Why don't we go over to the 17. I'll pass a couple of other planes up to right now. We'll go over to the nose first. Can you see it okay, Steve? Yep, we can see. Okay. As I said, this project actually started the first time the volunteers were here is January of 06. And um, it didn't look anything like this. Just as I say, keep in mind, 85% of everything you look at, we have made from scratch. Um, it's a G model, as you can see. Uh, we do have parts from five different planes. Uh, one is our data plate comes from a crash site in North Carolina. And they had actually put a fifth engine in this. They put a, a turboprop in the nose. They were experimenting. And it turned out more horsepower than all four engines put together. So we have parts from it. Uh, the rear section, we have parts off of a rear section of fuselage where the waste gunners were that was actually used as a prop for the TV series 12 o'clock high. If it, I can remember that, I'm old enough. But uh, it was smudged up from smoke pots and things they used when they were filming that. Um, horizontal stabilizer, we have parts from a crash site in Alaska. Uh, a group of our volunteers went up there a few years ago and for a $20 land use permit, they were able to go out in the boondocks and disassemble parts off of the plane. They had to helicopter them back to the airport at Talkeetna, Alaska. And then we trucked some of those parts back. And as I'm sure you know, a lot of the parts weren't usable 
but we can at least see how they're made and may make molds and whatever to uh, to make use of those. Um, interesting thing is our top greenhouse off our top turret. A lady from just south of here in Springfield, Ohio, called one day and said that she was tearing off her front porch off of her old house and that she found something we might be interested in. So they went down and took a look and learned that these greenhouses were actually made in Springfield, Ohio during the war. I don't know if you can see it. Her name was Beverly. She donated it and we have Beverly painted on the side of the top turret. But it, just to be clear, so what she was giving you was the uh, actually the the uh, the greenhouse that goes over the top of the cockpit, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Also inside there, I'm sure you can't see it, but there's four flare shells and a handheld flare gun. And that came from a crash site three miles west of here when a Aero Cobra crashed during World War II, totally destroyed it and killed the pilot. And one of our good local citizens held on to those items as a souvenir and they donated to us about three years ago. So you get an awful lot of that type of thing occurring. So many stories and so many people. As you can see on some of these panels, we let World War II crew members sign these panels. There's signatures all over the inside of the B-17. One crew member who became a volunteer here, he was actually on B-24 Liberators, died about two years ago. And the interesting thing about talking to him was his commander was Jimmy Stewart, the movie actor, and he knew him well. So he always had good stories. Yeah, you've had uh, you've had, had quite a few uh, World War II veterans that have come through to uh, to go ahead and sign. There's a lot of impressive names on that uh, on those panels. Yeah, we do. On our B-25, we actually have a, a Navy person. He since passed that signed. And if you're older, you'll know what I'm talking about. Underneath his name, he put Survivor USS Indianapolis. He was one of them that made it through without being attacked by the sharks. So, okay, we'll walk around the other side. Do you have any questions about any of this? Or? Not so far, but we're gonna have to take a nice up close look at that nose arc. I don't know if I mentioned it, but we are located in Champaign County. So now you know where the name comes from. <laughs> I was just going to ask. So did you, uh, did you have to build that, uh, the uh, rig that the uh, fuselage is sitting on or is that that's something that you were able to uh, inherit from another B-17? No, we built that. Uh, in fact, when you walk around to the wings, you'll see there on jigs, it was all done with laser. And uh, we have some laser jigs that we have loaned out uh, down in Georgia where they're restoring while well, rebuilding the Liberty Bell yep. and restoring another one. Uh, we actually built an engine to sell for the Liberty Bell after it burned. Right. And at that point, that gentleman hired five restoration people full time and borrowed our jig. <laughs> <laughs> so it's down there, but he was very generous, you know, Good. on reimbursing us for our engine to sell. So. Let's let's take a look in the nose there if we could. Yeah, as you can see, Gordon bomb site. And being a G, you know, here's the control yoke for the nose turret, the chin turret, I should say. When I first came here and I saw that seat for the bombardier, I thought, man, that looks pretty cheesy. But of course, it finally occurred to me, I'm sure that they went to a furniture office furniture company and they had a chair that looked like that. And they said, great, that'll fit. 
and I'm sure that's where those came from. Again, when it comes to the structure, almost everything you're looking at, we've built. And it looks like you're going for a pretty authentic uh, interior restoration as well. Right. Is that correct? Yeah, we have uh, Boeing plans on microfish that we got from the Smithsonian. And they tell me it was on the order of something like 26,000 pages of blueprints. So we reproduce them at whatever, we have a program, we reproduce them at whatever scale we need. We've actually reproduced the plans for the wing ribs at 100% and make jigs with those prints. Okay. Yeah, many, many years ago, I, I worked on uh, part of the restoration of uh, EIA's B-17 and aluminum overcast. So I, I know of the microfish that, uh, that, of which you speak. And it was, uh, at that time, we didn't have any way of converting it. So uh, we just had to kind of use those uh, as they were, but it was it fascinating, all the different drawings and uh, uh, plans that, that came from Boeing. Oh yeah, yeah, it sure is. Um, right here, you're looking at the right outer wing, okay? Now, as far as the spars and the inner ribs and the outer ribs, which we don't have on here right now, but we did have, uh, 75% of everything you're looking at, we have constructed. Um, we had, uh, just like I said, the right outer wing, the left outer wing is right over here. And we've had those ribs on them and had them skinned and everything, but we got the nose and the skin back off because one of the big holdups is that inner corrugated skin between the two spars. And we've got, a lot of original skin and we're actually hand sanding it to bare metal um, that's quite a chore and uh, then anodyning it and painting it and that's one of the things taking quite a bit of time we also have a tool and die maker here who made a, uh, a prep a jig whatever you want to call it to actually make some of this skin and we have made some of it uh, that was a bit of the trial and error to get that right so that when the, they took it out of there it didn't spring back out of shape so let's go over here a little further and be able to get a better look at some of this let's set it right here Okay, looking around here, this is the nose of the right outer wing. Looks kind of sloppy because it's got plastic on it, but we ah. can see that. Um, we can buy these little spars, but outside of that, it's pretty much 100% made by the uh, volunteers here at the museum. As I'm sure you know, those were to take on and off, but there are hundreds of screws you have to take out. You can see the uh, left outer wing right there. One of our biggest problems we had to figure out was all this riveting has to be bucked inside that cord, that square metal cord. And we couldn't figure out during World War II who had an arm long enough to reach down through there 10 feet or so. But we actually use a tube, a pneumatic tube with two bucking bars with an air bladder between it followed by fiber optic, a fiber op optic camera. And that's how they buck inside that that uh, cord. I don't know. Maybe you know. I don't know how they did it during World War II. I do not. Um, we're not even sure that that's how they, the, the way we're doing it is how they did it. Um, over here, I want to show you my project right quick. 
for the last five years, me and about average and about three other guys, about a day and a half a week are making the uh, cowling for the engines. This is one that's ready to be broken down and riveted. As you probably know, most of it was spot welded during World War II, but we're riveting it instead of spot welding it. But we were able to save or salvage probably 70% of the frame we needed. Of course, we broke it into individual parts, sandblasted it, aladined it, and painted it. And uh, quite a process. About 500 Clecos here. Yeah. They'll be off and on there five to six times before we reach this point. The biggest problem was the skins. There's three skins per cowling. There's three cowlings per engines. And we had a guy that initially pounded these out. We made a mold and then he pounded them and English wheeled them. But he right. ended up having to have rotator cuff surgery from all that and they can't do it anymore. So at any rate, um, here's one that is just about completely riveted. We got a few rivets up in here that we're going to have to hammer and buck. Yep. We do have a pneumatic rivet presser that was used at Willow Run uh, during World War II to build B-24s. We can use it for most of it, but there are places where you just have to do it the old fashioned way. Now. We got a third cowling in the back that's broken into thirds. Actually, this is an extra engine's worth. We have one set for the B-17 completely done. But of course, if we damage something or it breaks or whatever, we don't wanna to have to wait six months before we have that part. And in fact, all the control surfaces on the plane, uh, we are duplicating. We're making two of every right. control okay. surface so that you know, if something gets damaged, hanging, we can pull off the shelf, put it back on the plane right away. Yeah, okay. so, good thinking and some uh, some pretty nice uh, craftsmanship on that on that cowling. It uh, looks looks very good. Thank you. <laughs> it's a learning process, believe me. I'm sure. I'm sure. Now, uh, just a a point of I, I guess for my own uh, question is, uh, has the uh, local uh, Flight Standards Office been out to look at the airplane yet, or or have they been yeah. cooperating and, and helping you uh, in the restoration? Yeah, they're in quite often. Um, our project manager, you know, he can sign off on pretty much everything. Right. But yes, they are in, and they are involved very much. You know, they uh, luckily right from the beginning, the museum has involved them, and they they've been involved with us quite a bit. Good. Well, and the real question is whether they're actually coming to uh, inspect or just coming to get an up close look at the airplane. Well, the one day I was in here fairly early on and they were here, two of them came over and we were talking and I kind of got that second impression <laughs> to tell the truth about it. Uh, they really enjoy it. You know? Well, it's, it's not everybody who has a B-17 in their backyard. No, that's for sure. <laughs> in fact, we have a sign on a wall over here that says, how many chances will you get in your lifetime to help build a B-17? It's a very true. That was one of the volunteers said that one day and we thought that was pretty good. So it's up on the wall. <laughs> now, take a look at the inner wing. This is the right inner wing. Most all of it's been hand built by the volunteers. There are some parts, our cords are original, but three of them are cracked close to the base, which is a common issue. And we have splices on those that are Boeing approved. So back when we heard a B-17 recently was flying and heard a big crack in the wing, we said, we know what's wrong. Well, it didn't turn out to be that, but. Uh, that's a common issue. The ribs you see, like I said, we blew prints up to 100%, laid them on plywood and made jigs to make those. Now, something we did was we made three sets. So we have two other sets of ribs for a B-17. 
So if anybody out there needs them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you might trade or something like that. <laughs> Have there been any uh, parts that that you've just not been able to to uh, source at all that that you're that are on your uh, wish list? Normally, they can. We find it. If we don't, we make it. We have uh, several tool and die makers, and we have the milling machines and everything. And I'm amazed at the parts they they make. Um, we have ran into problems with some oddball parts, like the landing lights, their housings. Uh, would, there's no plans for them that we're aware of. They were outsourced by Boeing, and so we took a salvaged one and kind of you know, back engineered it and made those. And that occurs sometimes. Do you do any uh, CNC uh, work? Actually, no, not so, so far. Okay. In a old fashioned way, yeah. Uh, we're walking here between, and I'm sure you know, Steve, this is the way they built the 17s in two different parts. Right. And then roll them together and riveted them and bolted them. Now it looks a little junky in there because we're short on storage space, <laughs> but that's the nose of uh, one of the outer wings. Um, and this part of the plane's just about 100% done. You know, the ball turret will get hung in here, but everything's pretty well done. So one of our uh, one of our viewers is uh, asking, um, you know, you had mentioned the the corrugated skins were uh, difficult to clean and reproduce and and mount on the wings. Is there yeah. are there any other sections uh, of the aircraft that have uh, been more difficult than others that, that kind of stand out? All or is, of them. Or is, oh. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I can't think of any right offhand. Our project manager, Randy Kemp, was a B-52 crew chief, and he's just amazing. And uh, we pretty much just find a way. And um, I can't really think of anything. The main thing with a corrugated skin is you, we can't salvage enough of it. Right. And the fact that you get that spring back and, you know, the jigs are just not available anymore. We had to make them ourselves was a lot of the problem. We actually have a tool and die maker making a bigger one, uh, but it's been a long time coming. But we can only make it so wide because it has to fit in our heat treat oven. Ah, okay. We do the, except for something that's really exceptional, we do the heat treating here. So... Yep, but no, not really. In fact, if we spin around and look at the radio room, <laughs> radio compartment. Now, keep in mind, this was just about 100% built by volunteers. You'll see a lot of radios in there. And we have a gentleman who's been a licensed uh, ham operator since 1956. And he's restored all the radios to working condition. He still gets those vacuum tubes. In oh, fact, my. we had a we had a place here in Dayton where we could buy them. They've kind of gone out of business, but so he restored them all to working condition and uh, he's restoring other B-17 slash B-24 radios right now that are extra. But uh, yeah, quite an amazing guy. Let's see. Um, any other to B-17 or you want me to kind of move over to a couple of the other planes now? Well, um, actually, if you could uh, take a, can you, can we take a peek in one of the waste gun windows? Sure can. Which one you want to go with? Right there. You should really uh, introduce us to your uh, a camera person. Yeah, I should have. This is Jessica <laughs> Henry. Hi, everybody. She's, She's a gem. Couldn't get along with around all night. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't get along without her, believe me. Um, now, uh, moving over here. Can and also, can we move move back to the uh, to the we nose? Can. The nose or the tail? Nose. Ah, uh, the nose. The nose. Yep. We had a question about the uh, Norden bomb site.
and uh, this is from from Bruce. He's wondering where the clutch mechanism is that uh, connects the Norden to the autopilot. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> that's the bottom line answer. I wish I could tell you. Yeah. You know, so I don't know much about it. Yeah. That that, that bottom section, I, I believe. Yeah, that we're looking at right there. I believe that's that's more of the mechanism that that uh, connects to the autopilot. The actual Norton bomb site itself that. is that that top section with the the opt area right there. Yeah, that's that's the actual Norton, and then the the control box is below that. Obviously, yeah, you're we not actually going to, have more. Go ahead. Yeah, you're actually not going to hook that up to the to the autopilot, uh, but you can see there there's a cannon plug underneath, and that would be the wiring mm -hmm. harness that would that would run back to the to the cockpit. Mm -hmm. So I I hope that answered your question, Bruce. Yeah, also, I suppose you know, I suppose you know the crosshairs they used on those was women's blonde hair, never bleached, never treated. There we Were go. You aware of that? I was not. Actually, there was a lady during World War II that had blonde hair down to the floor, and they made a big production and promotion that she donated her hair, and that, oh, that's wow. a true story. That's what they used. Oh. Yeah. So, is there an original? Um, uh data plate number for the for the airplane or you're using a salvage data plate if i understood you correct along with right. the different pieces off okay. of that crash site in north carolina mm -hmm. okay yep okay any other Great. questions about that that i can't answer <laughs> <laughs> it's okay it's it's just fun to it's, it's fun to watch yeah i a lot of people ask about the wood yep and of course, we tell them, yeah, that's what they did to save the metal. Mm -hmm. So, and there's three or five wooden boxes that kind of look like a mailbox, an old type mailbox that they dropped the mail in. And I've ever heard that story. There's one on the uh, tail gunner section. And uh, I've asked every visitor, can you tell me what that is? And nobody's been able to answer it yet. And what it is is they had these metal containers or uh, pl cardboard containers with metal lids on them on each end. That was their toilet to a certain extent. And they would drop that into these five different locations and the ground crews would take them out. And the interesting thing is they're still made. They put yogurt in them now. <laughs> like I said, you learn something new every day. That's right. Um... Yeah. As we're um, maybe we can kind of head back toward the tail. We've got a question about the uh, the triangle S on the on the tail. You're getting your steps in today, that's for sure. <laughs> and thank you for uh, those of you in the audience asking questions. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll try to go back and forth and take a good look inside the airplane. Sure. So the question is, is uh, what brought about the decision to mark the aircraft in the triangle S of the 401st uh, bomb group? Uh, our viewer right. says it's nice to see a, a different 8th uh, Air, Force unit, uh, Air Force unit get recognized. Yeah, uh, that group was in here one time. Okay. But the S and the L, remember I said the Schiffer family mm -hmm. uh, started this project. So that's what the S is for. And the L is from the widow's first name. Okay. And that's what the volunteers wanted on the plane. So uh, really a great family, nice people. And the, the wife used to come in here every day, but age is catching up, so. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, were, there, uh, were there World War II veteran names on some of the ammo boxes? Um, I don't know about the ammo. I think so. I'd have some, to look again. Just, yeah, somebody just asked that. So, <laughs> all over the plane. The sad part is most of them have passed on. Right. Yep. Most of them have, but we still do get World War II veterans in here. Um, you know, still to this day. Sure. So. Hey, do you have a, a timeline for when you think the airplane might fly? 
Yes, Thursday. Good. Thursday. Um, yeah. <laughs> when they first started this project, I came in and looked at it two or three times each year. So I finally was retired and could volunteer. And uh, when they first started it, I was told eight or nine years. Yeah, right. We're actually moving fairly fast comparatively to most projects. We've had a lot of people from other projects in here, like the gas station B-17. Yep. They were in here for about two weeks getting pointers and so on and so forth. But we're thinking maybe eight or nine years out yet. We've got about in a neighborhood of 60 to 70,000 hours in it so far. Right. Yeah, and as you look at it, uh, looking at the, the waste gun section, you know the tail section is done, the, the cockpit and nose are pretty well done, but when you look at the wings and you think of uh, all of the the plumbing and uh, fuel tanks and all the skin that needs to go and be put on and then hang the engines and plumb them as well, it's, uh, yeah. Quite a you, job. Yeah. It is. Now, I will say this, we haven't scanned at it yet, but if you have a kind of turn the camera this, and up on this wall, you'll see a flap, the mm -hmm. wing tips, the ailerons, the bomb bay doors. On another wall, we have another flap. We have the engine nacelles, um, the engine cowling, uh, the rudder, the horizontal tail planes, they're all ready to go. So it's actually farther along than it looks like when you just look at the fuselage. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Jim Bain wants about... to, wants to know if uh, if you guys want the uh, tubes from his old uh, phonograph consoles. From his what? His phonograph consoles. <laughs> <laughs> we might be able to use them. Uh, a friend of mine gave me a little box that his neighbor had that had just a small thing, maybe 10 inches by 10 inches by 10 inches that had some gadgets in it that his neighbor claimed that they were old airplane parts. Yeah. And I brought them in and our project manager immediately recognized a red handled switch as the feather mechanism to feather the props on the B-17. So you just never know what's gonna show up. Uh, I, I, uh, Jim, if you're if you're serious about that, uh, go to uh, champagneaviationmuseum.org and and uh, send them a uh, little message on on what you have available. And who knows, Dan may take you up on that. Yeah, uh, we're you know no problem. We we get a lot of uh, donations of parts and things like that. And it's just again, it's just amazing what shows up. The gentleman walked in with a tube a couple three years ago, and when they unrolled it. Um, it was the markings, the Indian chief head mm -hmm. uh, on fabric from planes from the Lafayette Esker drill that were shot down during World War One. Wow. And donated them. You just never know what's going to walk through the door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, uh, Mike Helton is wondering uh, about how many people work on the restoration on a, on a pretty regular basis. Uh, you average about 10 people or so a day, five days a week. Okay. Uh, so, but we've got about 80 to 100 volunteers and it, it goes anywhere from one or two days a month to we have one volunteer that's in here about every day, Pat, I think, isn't it? Mm -hmm. actually what they do is when you get 2,500 hours, volunteer hours, they have a nylon flight coat, a nice one embroidered with the B-17 or the B-25, whichever you want, they give it to the volunteer. At 5,000 hours, they buy a really nice leather bomber jacket and our artist paints the champagne lady on the back. You don't see those except on special occasions the rest of the time. I think they're locked in safes at the volunteers' houses. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Well, how do you I put you on the spot here, but do you know how many of those uh, leather jackets uh, have been have been uh, given out? I honestly don't know. I would guess on the order of uh, I'll bet probably thirty or more. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty serious commitment to the project. Yeah, yeah. 
but it's uh, it's a lot of fun. We had uh, three years ago the Thunderbirds showed up here and spent the whole day. Okay. And they were more interested in us. I mean, we were really interested in them, but they were really interested in us. And we took them all rides on our B-25. It was included the ground crew. And uh, when I left here at 5.30, the ground crew was all gone, but the pilots were in a circle around our project manager out in the parking lot. And uh, he was holding court. They just, they just loved it. Oh, awesome. And then two days later, they flipped that F-16 at the uh, Dayton Air Show, if yeah. you remember that. Yep. And they had to cancel the rest of the air shows. We figured it was too many rides on the old B-25, just messed them up. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> yep. So let's, as long as we've got uh, some time here, let's take a look at maybe some of those other aircraft that are, uh, that are in your hangar. Sure thing. And uh, for those of you watching, if you're, Coming up with some uh, questions about the B-17, or actually any of the airplanes, just go ahead and type those in the in the uh, chat or comment section, and uh, we can always we can always come back. This is our Navy C-1 Trader cargo plane. They don't use them anymore. This one flew off and on the USS Lexington. It has the same engines as a B-17. Uh, Three years ago, a gentleman from Georgia, was a private owner, wanted to donate it someplace where it would be flown and hangered. And uh, he actually contacted us five years ago, got to the point where we hadn't heard anything from him. And I asked our director one day, what have we heard on that? And he said, if it's ever sitting right over there in the hangar, I'll know we're getting it. He'd given up on it. And by golly, exactly one week later, I walked in and there it sat in the hangar. And uh, he texts and said, they're sad. Text back, yes, why? No answer. And him and his co pilot flew in from Georgia and signed it over. So we've spent three years, our mechanics going through it. Of course, it had a certificate to fly, but they've been going through it for three years, replacing anything that was even remotely questionable and uh, it's ready to be tested and flown again. The one thing I like about it is the way the wings fold. They just don't fold up, they fold past each other. You could put seats in it for passengers or rapidly take those out and haul jet aircraft engines or whatever they had to haul that day. Now, do you plan to fly that to uh, air shows? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, right now, when we take our B-25 to air shows, we have to load everything in it. And as you well know, there's not a lot of room there. So here's our cargo plane. So it's going to work out pretty good. I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll move over to the 25. Now this B-25, it's champagne gal, as opposed to champagne lady. And we fly it quite often. We have the living history certificate flight experience. So we can take passengers on this plane. We can haul seven passengers. Uh, once we're off the ground, the pastors can take their seat belts off and go anywhere from the bombardier's position to the tail gunner's position in the plane. What's the uh, what's the history on on this uh, airplane? Uh, I really don't know the complete history. It's been around a lot of different places until we acquired it, and. Um, it was in pretty good shape, but we're constantly improving it. It's in it's really nice shape. Uh, it's a great plane to fly. Some of the loudest engines you'll ever hear when it comes to radio Indeed. landing. Yep. Uh, it's quite an experience. I get a kick out of the movie 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, where the crew chief slides over the bomb bay and he's having this nice conversation with the pilot and the co-pilot on the way to uh, Tokyo. 
And as you probably know, you can take your ear protection off this and screaming and the person's ear next to you and they cannot hear you. So that was, that really wasn't too realistic, but um, <laughs> yeah. A little flown, Hollywood magic. Yeah, it gets flown quite a bit. Um, and uh, I tell people that the most expensive part is going to the plastic surgeon and getting a grin taken off your face after you ride on it. So, <laughs> quite an experience. Yeah, it's flown over Washington, D.C. several times. Uh, we've had it, oh golly, oh, that was three years ago, I was in Tennessee, uh, down there at Tullahoma mm -hmm. and, uh, for a weekend. And uh, it just goes everywhere. People love it. Now, I noticed the, uh, the the finish on the paint uh, on this and on on the C2 uh, is, is really very nice. Was the was the C2 uh, painted since you've had it, or did it come looking that good? No, it came that way. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's original. Okay. So, do you have do you have paint facilities in your hangar, or do you have to uh, go somewhere else to have the aircraft painted? No, <laughs> we got a paintbrush, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of the parts we got a three part catalytic paint that we paint with them but no we'd have to take it somewhere else for the spray painting yeah okay. uh, again the nose art was done by our uh, uh, resident artist and you know when people come through here I'll often open up the hatches and let them take a look inside and uh, one thing we always caution them about and I'm sure you know that is don't grab anything painted red because the explosive hatches are charged and uh, people just get a kick out of things like that. And I'm sure as you're also well known as a volunteer, once a year, we can take a one day training session and then we have to pass a written test. Okay. And then we're allowed to work with the plane when it's in operation. That's a requirement of the FAA. And believe me, they check it all over, including those uh, test papers uh not just to make sure you pass the test but to make sure everything's dated right and just they go over it with a fine tooth comb of course so what about that little uh yellow airplane that's kind of behind the uh 25. well i can't tell you a lot about that <laughs> do you know jessica uh civil air patrol yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I do know that. Um, submarines off the east coast of the united states mm -hmm. during world war ii Stinson. Mm -hmm. We also have a Fairchild in great shape. It's not in here right now, obviously. And if I'm not mistaken, is that a uh, Walt Disney uh, artist's uh, uh, squadron patch that they they had done? I think you may be correct on that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it flies. Okay. Outside, I don't know if we can look into the sun, but we have an A26 that we're going oh. to restore. It was flown in here when we got it. I don't know how well you can see that. Yep, we, we can see the outline at least. <laughs> mm -hmm. Looks like a, a a pretty sunset coming your way as well. Yes, that's one of the reasons so, why we the other hangar we have yeah. a lot more than what we can put inside right now. Yeah. In fact, the Yankee Air Museum donated a G three glider to us about a year and a half ago, a two place glider that they uh -huh. restored, and it was used to train the Waco assault glider pilots during World War II. And of course, Waco was right here in our area that built, of course, the aircraft before the war, but then built the gliders during the war. So yeah. we have um, just say in the back, I don't think we'd get a good signal back there, but on the wasps that we're developing. Oh, good. And, uh, it's really, we're really lucky to have it. 
uh, we have kiosks where you can touch the picture of the wasp. You'll get an iteration. We've got a big, huge flat screen that's going in. So that just grants for, and we'll give the history on the wasp and so on and so forth. And it was kind of neat. The other day there was a visitor in here and asked if we knew anything about a wasp named so and so. And by golly, she was on our kiosk. I was able ah. to touch the button. The lady was able to, to learn about her. Um, and the uh, Air Force Museum, if I'm wrong, Jessica, but the set designer designed an entrance once we get another grant to that display that's pretty impressive. We we'll also have a link trainer. Okay. Uh, we're two link trainer now. And a piece of good gentleman standing there looking at the museum for the first time. And I talked to him and he said, I'm retired from the Air Force. I used to maintain simulators for the Air Force. And he kind of pointed at the link trainer and says, As a matter of fact, me and three other guys restored one of these one time. Well, guess what he's doing? <laughs> he's a volunteer and uh it was a derelict but he has it operating uh and everything and then we learned there was a lady on the other side of the state that had another link trainer in the top of her old garage wow. and she donated it to us and he's restoring it also so we feel real, real lucky to have those all right hey, if we could just before we wrap up tonight let's uh can we head back over to the uh to the nose art on the uh, champagne lady Yes, sure thing. There we go. Well, we've uh, I think we've got all the the questions uh, answered that that have have come in. But um, any final thoughts as we uh, wrap up tonight? No, we just appreciate you thinking about us and. Um, Actually, here at the museum, we're open Tuesday through Saturdays, and we do not charge for visitors. It's free. And we are a 5013C tax free organization, and over 90% of our operating costs come from donations. So sure. they wanted to start this for the living history reasons. And when they, the family started it, they did not want visitors charged to go through a museum. So it's if anybody wants to stop in, it's completely free, and we're glad to have them. How does how does one find uh, Grimes Field if uh, they're in the uh, in the area? Um, we're located on State Route 68 in Urbana, Ohio. We're on the west central side of Ohio. And of course, probably a lot of your people know it. This came about because Mr. Grimes was the guy who developed most of the aircraft lighting. Um, and uh, they are still here. Uh, they're not owned by Grimes anymore, but they still manufacture a lot of aircraft lighting in this, this town of about, what is it, about 12, 15,000? Something like that, it's not real big. But I know they had a, a tri-motor uh, stint steerman, 1937 American airliner down here, a guy restores planes on the south end of the field. And it's uh, part of that collection that the gentleman owns down in Texas that owns 70 some. Okay. And I put my camera up, my cell phone, and took a picture of the tip uh, of the wing, the aircraft lighting, and sure enough, it said Grimes Manufacturing, Urbana, Ohio, on it. It's amazing. That, it, that area is uh, the area you're in is steeped in in aviation history. And yeah, uh, one more part, time, what, go go ahead. We're part of the National Aviation uh, Heritage Area, along with Wright Pat, and uh, where the Right B Flyer is and the Wright Brothers Cycle Shop and things like that. We're part of that. Awesome. And uh, if uh, someone would like to get in contact with you or just find out more about the museum, uh, give us that website address again. Our website is champagneaviationmuseum.org. And it's spelled champagne like the county. <laughs>
just Google Champagne Aviation Museum and it'll pop up. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Dan and Jessica, for uh, sharing Champagne Lady with us this evening and the rest of, uh, or at least part of the uh, the collection that's that's there at the museum. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate you uh, taking time to uh, to do that tonight. And uh, again, folks, uh, go out and visit their website. You can find out more about the uh, museum and keep up to date on the progress on the uh, B-17. So thank you again for uh, everyone for joining us. Again, click that like or subscribe and follow us button so uh, we can let you know about future shows. As always, if you have any ideas for a future topic, something you'd like to hear about, send Leah Block an email at media at cifhq.org. Again, thank you to Dan Dickerson and Jessica Henry for uh, taking us around the uh, the hangar tonight. Until next time, for the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night. <laughs>